Our speaker for today is Professor Rajat Sandhir. Dr. Sandhir has received his MSc and PhD degree in biochemistry from the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, Chandigarh. He has been at the Department of Biochemistry, Punjab University for more than 20 years. His research revolves around the biochemical and molecular mechanisms involved in the development of neurodegenerative conditions like metabolic encephalopathies, dementias, and brain injury, with a particular interest to investigate the role of oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunctions, and alterations in the permeability of blood-brain barrier. He has over 200 papers to his credit and has mentored more than three dozen students for PhD. He was awarded with the Katie Shetty Memorial Oration Award in 2021 by the Indian Academy of Neurosciences and has recently been conferred with Mrs. Abida Mehdi Award for outstanding contributions in the field of neurosciences by the Indian Academy of Biomedical Sciences. He's also a fellow of Indian Academy of Neurosciences and Indian Association of Biomedical Sciences. Thank you, Professor Sandeer, for joining us. Thank you. Now the stage is all yours. I'm stopping share my screen and you can start the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kunal, for having me on this platform. And I'm impressed with the activities that uh, ACS is doing. And I've seen probably you've done over 100 virtual talks. And I'm one of them. It's, it's a pleasure to be part of this galaxy of people who've been giving talks on this. And I picked up a topic uh, related with hydrogen sulfide because this is a molecule less known, less discussed. So I thought I probably would be sharing some of my thoughts. And we got started with this molecule a few years back. So we all knew this molecule as a toxic gas. And now we have learning, emerging to learn that this is playing a key role in health and disease. And I would say at Punjab University, my lab is interested in looking at um, spreadic Alzheimer disease, how diabetes connects with Alzheimer disease, Parkinson's disease, we are looking at neuroprotective molecules in that. And we also looked at some of these beneficial effects of uh, hydrogen sulfide in neurodegenerative disorders also. So I'll not be talking about my research particularly, but I'll give you an overview of how important is this molecule now. And uh, so we all know hydrogen uh, sulfide as a gas that comes, gives a particular odor, which is described as rotten egg odor. And all students from chemistry are familiar with this odor because a lot of experiments in chemistry lab would depend on hydrogen sulfide generation, and especially the salt, uh, uh, um, analysis methods would need that. And this gas was discovered by Swedish chemist Shelley in 1777. And if you look at this molecule, it's, this molecule is almost like water, bent molecule. But the only difference between water and this molecule is this molecule is gaseous. For the reason it doesn't form hydrogen bonds. And molecular weight is 34.1, boiling point less than minus, uh, minus 60 degrees centigrade, melting point is 85.5, and is soluble in water. And it is abundant in nature and mainly coming from anaerobic decay of sulfur containing organic matter. And so a lot of times you will see the rotten, rotten eggs kind of smell from sewer and septic tanks. And this is what we've been knowing uh, as far as hydrogen sulfide is for many, many now uh, centuries. And it was also used as a weapon of chemical warfare during the First World War. And this is the famous KIPS operators that I was referring to while you were doing chemistry experiments. You will use by RNA uh, iron sulfur and H2SO4 to generate H2S, which was used for this uh, salt analysis experiments. And this is also what has been known for centuries that it is a bad gas, which at lower concentration would only give you odor. That is the distinctive rotten egg flavor or odor. And as the concentration go up, you can see the amount of obnoxious effects of this gas would increase. For example, at lower concentration, you will have irritancy. It might affect, cause irritation to the eyes, breathing passages, cough, headache, nausea, loss of sense, uh, loss of sense of smell. And if the concentrations go beyond 250 uh, ppm, it would affect nervous system. You will have difficulty breathing, fluid in the lungs, vomiting, dizziness, loss of coordination, stumbling, staggering, 
collapse and knockdown and loss of coordination. So it is affecting CNS at this at these levels, and it can also be fatal at concentrations more than 750 parts per million. And this is the first knowledge that we have as far as utilization of hydrogen sulfide from by the bacteria is concerned. There are bacteria that would use sulfate and sulfate reducing bacteria to be more specific. And, and this was reported from anoxic earth. That means in the, when the oxygen was not present approximately 300.8 billion years ago. And these bacteria would dissimulate uh, the sulfur compounds. And this was the oldest form of bacterial life that has been known. And these bacteria would use these sulfur substrates to produce H2S, and which was a product and product of anaerobic respiration. So that means the metabolism of these bacteria was dependent on hydrogen perox uh, hydrogen sulfide. And Slowly, what happened before the great oxidation event, which occurred 2.5 billion years ago, led to increased amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. And slowly, what happened was the metabolism got shifted towards oxygen dependent metabolism. But S2S remained the most abundant and versatile chemical on the primitive Earth. And so that is what I said H2S, in fact, is widely believed to be the primordial sustainable energy source from the studies on these sulfate producing bacteria, And so they would use this uh, sulfides for terminal electron acceptors. We all know in, when we talk about oxygen, oxygen actually is the terminal acceptor in all modern organisms that we see today. So oxygen gets converted to water and that's how we get this uh, uh, energy in the cells. And this role was being done by uh, these uh, sulfur uh, reducing organisms. And even today's green and purple sulfur bacteria are still using S2S as the uh, sulfur substrates as the energy source. And so that means what I want to give you a message here is sulfide based metabolism is the one that was the most primitive. Now we have this oxygen based life that on the planet. And this has evolved from hydrogen sulfide based metabolism to oxygen-based metabolism. So I said this, we knew hydrogen sulfide as toxic gas, and majority of the research that was conducted for centuries was based on only looking at a toxicological point of view. And so studies published as long back as 1833 highlighted the detrimental effects of hydrogen sulfide on animals. The recent data also is available, which is looking at gene expression data of hydrogen sulfide, how it in, interferes with a lot of toxic uh, effect cells and impairs respiratory and metabolic functions. And you can say it is a cellular poison. That's what we've been concentrating for centuries uh, as far as this uh, molecule is concerned. The physiological role was not known for this molecule till I would say 1924. The first study came from Vincent du Vinegard. What he did, discovered was there is a metabolism that happens in the cells called transsulfuration pathway, which produces H2S. And there are amino acids that would be involved in this interconversion, cysteine, homocysteine, and they will have an intermediate use called cystathione. And this was done in vitro, taking the liver supernatants or liver homogenates. And you could say production of H2S was seen for the first time. So it's trying to tell you that H2S was existing in the biological systems and there was a metabolic pathway that was generating S2S in the um, cells. Later on, studies were done. They could find out key enzymes in these pathways called cystathione. And this would be studies from, I would say, 80s, where they looked at these enzymes called cystathione beta synthase. As the name suggests, this would be an intermediate path step in the pathway, cystathione gamma lyase, it's abbreviated as CSC. And there was another enzyme which was recently discovered called mercaptopyruvate sulfotransferase, abbreviated as 3MST. And so these three enzymes also indicated that there is a biosynthesis pathway that exists in the cells, but we still do not know, did not know what it is doing in the cells. So later on in 80s, 
people started looking at if we can measure the amounts of hydrogen sulfide in the brain tissues. It was seen if you look at these values in the brains of humans, the concentration was something in the range of 0.65 to 0.73 microgram per gram. In the animal, it was slightly higher, 1.57 micrograms per gram. Why and why the brain was studied? Because brain somehow has more amounts of H2S compared to the rest of the tissues. Interestingly, this enzyme which I uh, listed in the top, cystathione beta synthase, is present in very high amounts in the brain. Where other enzymes are present in other tissues, the brain somehow has this enzyme which is exclusive to this. So whenever you want to say something is existing, you have to also do carry your studies to demonstrate we can block this production also. So what they had done was they had taken CBS inhibitors, hydroxylamine and amino oxyacetic acid, and shown that H2S production could. That means you could demonstrate the pathway, you could demonstrate H2S levels, and finally you could also re uh, show a reduction in H2S levels by giving CBS inhibitors. Interestingly, another studies in 1990s showed that H2S facilitates induction of hippocampal long-term potentiation. So for people who are not from neuroscience, I would say this study indicated that it is involved in memory formation or memory consolidation. So that means H2S role as a biological molecule was emerging during these times. This is the number of papers that have been published all the talks about from 1880. And you can see 1920s when I said the first papers on biological roles started appearing. 18, 1800s, we were only concentrating on toxicology of H2S. And you can see there was a peak around 80s and then slowly there is a gradual increase and then it peaks around 2015. And what I want to show you is the journey. We are talking about production of H2S by bacteria was shown early 1920s. Then discovery of transsulfuration pathway, which generated H2S, which I showed you in the earlier slide. And then we showed it inhibits cytochrome C oxidase, which is one of the mitochondrial enzymes. So that means it is a mitochondrial poison that was discovered this. And till this time, we were saying this is a toxic molecule only. So slowly we started understanding its biological role. And one of the roles that was early picked up was in 1996, H2S as a neuromodulator. That means it modulates the brain function. Vasorelaxant, 2001, it relaxes the blood vessels, that means dilates them. And it is an inflammatory, inflammatory modulator. Another interesting discovery was it modifies certain proteins in the cell by the process of S persulfidation, which is a key event in its biological role. And then we also started looking at role in bacteria and then H2S contributes to antibiotic resistance, and there are other effects that have come. The people have also shown that it is good for in treating um, and bacterial infections and even viral conditions. So I, when I was preparing this talk, I wanted to see why there is a dip in this uh, after 2015. But interestingly, I picked up this from PubMed today morning itself, and you can see these are 12,954 results that are picked up. 1924 was the first paper that comes in PubMed. And you can see the number of publications are ever increasing. So what I showed in the previous picture, actually, you still have continued interest in this molecule uh, currently also. And there are a lot of things that have been implicated in this. So when I said there are three enzymes that I talked to you, which are involved in the senses, one of them is cystathione. Gamma laya, lyase, cystathione, beta synthase, and this mercaptopyruvate sulfur transferase. This enzyme is present in the mitochondria, again expressed in the brain. Look at this enzyme. I said this is again expressed in brain. And this enzyme is pyridoxal phosphate dependent enzyme. Even cystathione, gamma lyase is also pyridoxal phosphate dependent enzymes but predominantly present in liver and kidneys. That means you have different pathways that makes this enzyme in liver or other tissues compared to that in the brain. And this is the pathway. And uh, so we can say the most important component is in this is homocysteine. 
Homo cysteine, I don't know how many of you follow the literature, is now one of the key molecules that have been in, implicated in cardiovascular disease. A lot of patients who go to cardiologist, they will also like to monitor homocysteine levels. But nobody is linking a whole of this story with S2S levels. So homocysteine, if you have increased homocysteine levels, you are at risk of cardiovascular disease. There are other diseases also that are now coming, which have a sure relationship with increased homocysteine levels. So what I want to highlight in this picture is the pathways that are generating S2S. You can see various steps using the CSC, blue are the S2S. Besides that, you have this 3-MST, which I said is a mitochondrial enzyme, again is generating S2S. So you have a lot of steps in these pathways where these enzymes would generate uh, S2S. And there's another enzyme now which has been discovered, which is cysteine amino transferase, which is also contributing towards generation of this S2S. So this is an interesting title, which is from a journal from 2002, which said two is a company, three is a crowd. Can H2S be the third endogenous gaseous transmitter? We know there are two gaseous transmitters, nitric oxide, very popular. A lot of cardiovascular uh, treatments are based on treating nit uh, nitric oxide levels or modulating nitric oxide levels. Then came carbon monoxide, which again we knew as a toxic molecule. Now we know this H2S is the third endogenous gaseous transmitter. So when I talk about nitric oxide, it is also a diffusible molecule. It can diffuse into the cells and this gives us the advantage. It is not a conventional molecule because conventional molecule would need receptors, transporters for crossing from one cell to another. So the interesting title says, so this is the third gaseous transmitter that we have discovered in the recent times. And uh, there, so coming back to, do we get S2S from natural sources also? We all been knowing that onions, garlic are good for a lot of things. Cardiovascular effects been known for last, I think 15, 20 years. And why so? Because these, uh, this onion or garlic would have this organosulfur compounds. These organosulfur compounds would get transformed and generate H2S in the body, which would be absorbed. And I would also like to say one thing, I'll not get into this part of the figure because I'll be discussing this with you in detail. So what I want to emphasize here is that these molecules that are generated and uh, uh, from these molecules are leading to many beneficial effects. So two major contributions coming in H2S that we have in our body. One is from endogenous sources. We can also have H2S from exogenous sources. Bacteria in the gut will also generate H2S. That could be also be absorbed. I would also like to say one thing more here. The amount of H2S that is required for protective effects is much less compared to any of the molecules you can think of. So that is the reason there's more interest in this molecule now. So I said some of the things to you earlier. So I said H2S, this is what H2S can do. It can prevent oxidative stress. Reactive oxygen species are produced in a lot of disease processes. Inflammation is also common to a lot of disease processes. And this, can, this molecule can act as an inhibitory molecule. Vasodilation, it can do uh, dilate blood vessels. It can also influence endothelial cells in terms of their survival, proliferation, migrations. And that would also play a role in the response to uh, injury in any case, aggregation coagulation, that means something to do with the clotting also. And we'll take examples of this. It can also influence angiogenesis. I'm not, not getting in detail of e each of these, but I'm just listing them here. Apoptosis is a mechanism involved in cell death, which is called programmed cell death, which is the process of normal phasing out of cells, physiological cell death at times. Angiogenesis is forming of blood vessels. So you can see the pleiotropic properties of this molecule. It does so many multiple functions. It also is involved in regulating certain genes and uh, will, and it also interacts with certain metal ions. And that is another reason that it exerts its action. For example, it 
when i said cytochrome oxidase it is it interacts the cytochrome oxidase has copper at the active site so it will react with copper there and inhibit um, cytochrome oxidase so this molecule has pleiotropic properties so one of the functions that i like to talk to you is its antioxidant function so this is h2s what it can do is it can save this molecule called glutathione which is we call it as first line of defense both these molecules have sulfhydryl group so h2s would save glutathione glutathione for people who are not aware i would like to say is a tripeptide which has cysteine at the active site so this is cysteine is the critical component of glutathione and it is important to uh, save this uh, glutathione and so h2s by saving glutathione would block reactive oxygen species prevent oxidative stress one one way it can do that means direct effect of of h2s is saving glutathione it can also react directly with reactive oxygen species and save it then other thing is it modifies proteins h2s and this is one of the molecules called nrf2 nrf2 is a transcription factor that means it regulates a lot of genes and this is normally present bound to another protein called keep one so when it is bound to this complex it will not function so when this h2s modifies this keep one because of this uh, um sulfur sulfonylation what would happen is this nrf2 become would become free and nrf2 is nuclear response factor 2 so what it does is it goes and binds to the nucleus on the area or dna elements called antioxidant response element as the name suggests antioxidant response element would generate antioxidant enzymes so these are antioxidant enzymes that would be uh, increasingly expressed that means there would be increased expression of these antioxidant enzymes catalase superoxide dismutase glutathione peroxidase glutathione s transferase which again would prevent oxidative damage so you can see i've just shown two mechanisms how h2s have been and the, there are st studies that have demonstrated this convincingly that these are the key mechanism that are involved in h2s action so just to illustrate what i was showing you earlier h2s is able to modify keep so once keep is modified there is a conformational change this conformational change frees nrf2 so that it can go bind to the dna elements turn on antioxidant genes and prevent oxidative stress the other pathway that is involved is based on another molecule called sits serotonins serotonins for the people who are not aware it's called a protein where it is it is a molecule which is protective and it is anti aging and i'll like give you an example we say red wine is good because it contains one of the chemicals called resveratrol resveratrol exerts its ac action through search search only so resveratrol is anti aging because it stimulates search pathways so what i would like to say here is h2s again can stimulate search pathways and generate these superoxide dismutase and there would be other genes also which would be playing role in antioxidant response which will be turned on through cert pathways also besides that it can also increase nadh which is a reducing equivalence which can also block reactive oxygen species so you can see h2s we were new knowing this as a toxic gas which will be lethal but now i'm saying it is a molecule which is antioxidant which was hard for us to believe that this would be the role of this molecule then i said this can also be anti inflammatory so antioxidant roles i have said to you earlier you can look at look at what it can do it can prevent leukocyte endothelial cell adhesion the cell to cell fusion and if it prevents that adhesion the cells would be able to migrate and this is beneficial as an anti inflammatory uh, molecule it also reduces edema and there are other functions it can cause it can have an it can stimulate neutrophil apoptosis it can cause vasodilation there are other functions that would also be implicated as its anti inflammatory role but primarily it is involved in 
regulating a, uh, tra another transcription factor called NF kappa B. We know when NF kappa uh, active, is activated, there is secretion of inflammatory molecules. So it can prevent this, reduce NF kappa B activation, thereby acting as anti-inflammatory -infl molecule also. And this is another pathway where it has been shown that if you give this pro-inflammatory molecule, which causes inflammation, this is called TNF alpha. This TNF alpha can stimulate a protein again on the DNA, which forms this CSC, which, which is an enzyme involved in production of uh, S2S. So moment TN you are exposing the cells to inflammatory molecules, you see there is increased production of S2S. And there is increased production directly on, based on the effect of cytokines on SCSE also. So what it does now is it again modifies this subunit of NF kappa B, P P65 subunit of NF kappa B. And moment it gets modified, now it binds to another protein called RSP3. So this complex is formed, which promotes now anti-apoptotic genes. So that means it will prevent cell death. So, in, so I've talked about three roles of this antioxidant role, anti-inflammatory role, and anti apoptotic role of H2S. So this is the mechanism that I was trying to highlight that a lot of times these proteins would get, get modified by H2S and you will see modified proteins would change, show conformational change. And that is one of the reasons how the signaling changes in the cell. So some of the examples I illustrated in the uh, figures that I showed you earlier. So now coming to its role now, I will not be talking about all roles, but I will only depict few roles of H2S. H2S has been shown to be beneficial in traumatic brain injury, spinal cerebral ataxia, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington disease, all neurodegenerative disorders. And in the case of Alzheimer's disease, it prevents the production of toxic peptide that is called a beta peptide. This is the peptide that is considered to be the main reason for uh, amyloidogenesis that happens in Alzheimer's disease. And you can see multiple steps at which this blocks. And interestingly, normally we form A beta 40. So we, because of these changes in proteolytic enzymes, we form a, a peptide which is two minus it longer. And that is what is causing the pathology. So H2S can prevent this. If you go to, in the case of Huntington disease, what happens is, this red circles indicate mutant, mutant Huntington. Mutant Huntington is able to bind to a transcription factor that is involved in uh, expression of this uh, hydrogen sulfide producing gene called CSC. So moment this is bound here, you will see decrease in levels of these uh, CSC that would reduce H2S levels. So by giving H2S, I can reverse whatever was created by deficiency of CSC. Other thing is another transcription factor, ATF4, which is decreased in the case of Huntington disease can be increased with supplementation of H2S. So these are some of the functions that have been convincingly shown in the case of Alzheimer's disease. This would make more sense. You look at now healthy cell. The, Healthy cells would have a protein called Parkin. Parkin is a protein, as the name suggests, involved in Parkinson's disease. The role of this protein is to degrade the accumulated proteins in the cell. And you can see normally what happens is there is this protein has to be degraded. This protein using Parkin's is ubiquitinated, that means modified. Tagging of this protein has happened. And then this proteasome degrades this protein and finally, the clear of the protein. What happens in Parkinson's disease is this Parkin gets nitrosylated and is not able to carry out this ubiquitination, neither proteasomal uh, degradation. And what would be the result? This protein would get aggregated, and that would really lead to accumulation of synuclein, which is a protein deposit that we have in, uh, in Parkinson's disease, and which forms new bodies. So that means. Parkin modification 
is different in Parkinson's disease because the H2S levels are low and that is what is playing a key role. Cardiovascular disease, a lot of, uh, it's said, first beneficial role of H2S cells were known from cardiovascular disease. It prevents myocardial infarction, myocardial fibrosis, heart failure, diabetic cardiomyopathy, cardiac hypertrophy, arrhythmias, ischemia, reperfusion injury. So almost all, so it's almost, if you take my word, it almost looks like as if it's a panacea for a lot of things. So if you look at how it pre prevents, it looks, uh, it increases micro, my, myocardial angiogenesis, that means it forms blood vessels, improves vascular function, it prevents myocardial and renal fibrosis, it increases the nitric oxide levels also. I did not, I'm not going to discuss that, but there is a crosstalk between nitric oxide and uh, carbon monoxide also within the system. And uh, it increases exercise tolerance, reduces oxygen stress, and uh, it also improves NRF2, AKT signaling pathways, almost the kind of things that I was showing you earlier. It uh, reduces oxidative stress via NRF2 upregulation. It reduces cellular apoptosis via the pathways. Even chemotherapy induced inflammation is reduced in this uh, in heart conditions. So cardiac re remodeling also this would play a role, and there are other roles that would come from in in terms of how it improves mitochondrial functions and respiration and uh, improves survival post myocardial infarction. So a lot of beneficial effects of this in the case of cardiovascular disease. Obesity, hypertension, type 2 diabetes mellitus, all where you see beneficial roles. Decreases lipolysis in adipose tissues, decreases hepatic fat deposition, leptin, uh, decreases leptin signaling, the satiety hormone increases that adiponectin. And you can see the functions continue, blood pressure, it can modulate blood pressure because it is also a vasodilator and nitric oxide signaling and channels also, potassium channels, which are modulated by, sorry, modulated by ATP, endothelial functions, oxidative stress, things like that. In type two diabetes, it is modulating beta cell insulin secretion, adipose tissue glucose uptake, and reduces diabetic nephropathy, improves diabetic wound healing, and these all have been backed by experimental studies that I'm showing you here. How about its role in cancer? Increased levels of S2S actually would be bad for cancer cells. Because, see, I, you have to understand one thing, anything, we always say, anything, cancer cell is proliferating cells. So we need to save, reduce the proliferation in the cancer cell. Whereas another disease, whether I talk of neurodegenerative disease or cardiovascular disease, I need to save the cells. So the cells don't die. Here, I want the cells to undergo cell death because the cells are multiplying. So H2S levels have been seen to be increased in cancer cells and that would lead to all these hallmarks that you see in cancer cell, whether you talk of increased cancer metabol cell metabolism, angiogenesis, cancer metastasis, evading cells would evade apoptosis because of uh, in the cancer, and H2S is going to promote all these functions, even prevent DNA repair. So, what do you need to think in the case of cancer is therapies to reduce H2S levels in the cells specifically. So other conditions, I was saying you need to increase H2S levels. Here, I'm saying you need to reduce H2S levels so that you can prevent uh, metastasis and uh, other hallmark changes that happen in cancer cells. So this is almost a summary of what H2S can do. There's no tissue in the body that is not influenced by H2S. Skeletal muscles, lungs, gastrointestinal tract, heart, bone, bladder, genitals, liver, pancreas, spleen, immune, vasculature, eyes, brain, brain, we said, neurotransmission, memory, oxygen sensing, all where H2S has playing a key role. And uh, so let's change gears. What is it doing in case of bacteria? In bacteria, it is helping 
and it is cytoprotective. So, so what, what it can do is it can, S2S can block certain enzymes in the respiration of bacterial metabolism. It can promote certain enzymes. It can also block reactive oxygen species. And uh, you can expect this to be cytoprotective in certain bacteria. And other than that, in terms of viruses, it has been seen that H2S can act anti as an antiviral agent by preventing replication of different kinds of viruses. And again, you can see the kind of players that I'm showing you are similar NF kappa B, NRF2. So keep, keep one, and you can see antioxidant response, inflammatory response, all playing role, even in its um, role in case of bacteria and in the case of viruses also. So there is more interest as far as these molecules are concerned in terms of um, um, viral and micro, microbial diseases also. Trying to now sum up on how does it target? We said free radical scavenger. We said, I'm, I did not talk about these ion channels. If you guys say it can modulate TRP V channels, which got Nobel Prize for uh, in uh, 2021 for the work on um, heat and cold receptors and capsaicin receptors. So uh, potassium uh, ATP modulated ion channels I showed you earlier. So it is influencing these ion channels also. It is influencing certain transporters also. Here, when it's influencing this. Uh, ATP modulated potassium channels, it leads to vasodilation and uh, it is in, increasing the cysteine and glutathione transport phenomena, NF kappa B, depending on concentration and cell types, it can increase or decrease NF kappa B. That means it has, has immunomodulated role. It, it also, NRF2, I said, is antioxidant machinery that is involved. Direct effect of this is as a metal ion chelator also and cytochrome C oxidase, where it will interfere with mitochondrial respiration. And this is one of the toxic effects that we said was known before we knew the biological roles of this. And lastly, it also regulates certain other transcription factors. Another one is TAT1, which is pro-survival or angiogenesis inducing factor. This is some study from our lab, just to give you a flavor of something that we did on H2S. So we created a model of uh, depression in the animal by giving an, anti, uh, by giving an inflammatory molecule called Lipopolysaccharide, lipopolysaccharide, when given to the animals, would stimulate inflammation in the brain and re releasing these inflammatory cytokines. Once this brain is inflammated, we have immune cells in the brain which are in the resting state and they go into the active state. So you can see how the cells she um, Professor Sandeer, uh, can you hear us? Okay, so uh, looks like we have some internet connectivity issues. So please give us a, uh, give us a second and we'll be uh, back with you soon. I'm sorry, there was a disruption. I don't know what happened, some net issue. All right. So now coming to, I said, I built up the story on H2S saying that is a wonderful molecule. So can we come up with strategies to deliver this molecule? People have been focusing on developing novel therapeutics based on H2S. So I showed you one example where we gave NIHS as a a molecule to increase H2S levels in the brain. So you can give other inorganic salts and they've been shown to be anti-inflammatory, cardioprotective, 
and ameliorates diabetes also. There are other chemicals also that have been uh, in the market now, commercially available, which have which have the ability to uh, deliver H2S in the cells. And you can see these are all something like organosulfur compounds, and they will have antioxidant properties, anti-inflammation, anti-cancer, and channel modulation, and uh, vasodilation, and func different functions. And the list is long. I've just brought few for illustration. And uh, all right. Maybe one of my slides is somehow not visible anyway. So we know now H2S is playing key role in a lot of things. Sent in brain, we know a lot of disease. In cardiovascular also, we know a lot of conditions, pulmonary functions also, all where H2S is involved and gastrointestinal functions. And there are disease conditions associated with all these where H2S can be beneficial. And one source of H2S could also be bacterial bacteria present in the gut that would generate H2S and that will be entering into the physiological system. So trying to now sum up what I said to you, H2S is a third gastrotransmitter to be discovered that influences gastrointestinal, neuronal, cardiovascular, respiratory, renal, and hepatic system. And the list is long. I've just listed few here. And it has a variety of biological functions, plays an important role in number of physiological and pathological processes. And through multiple pathways, it acts as a cytoprotective target. And there is an increase, increase in interest in developing S2S donor systems that can be designed for varying release profiles, even targeting delivery. And you are looking at different properties and there could be triggers that could be added to this so that means you want to modulate the environment and then release these H2S whenever there is need and in what amounts. And which could then be used as potential therapeutic for various potential therapeutic applications. And uh, thank you. And this is Punjab University campus, one picture of Punjab University campus. We, we have this iconic building called Gandhi Bhavan. Visit us sometime whenever anyone of you who's not from Chandigarh is visiting Chandigarh.